Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2011 Changing China Lecture, or China Changing Lecture, I should say. My name's Michael Wesley, I'm the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. Tonight we have the second of our China Changing Lectures, a, sp a series sponsored by the Australia China Council, for whose support we are very grateful. This series is the brainchild of Malcolm Cook, who is currently the Dean of International Studies at Flinders University and who was until recently the director of the Lowy Institute's East Asia program. Malcolm rightly felt that if there is an ultimate challenge about to our understanding of the outside world, it must be China. China challenges our understanding because it is big and complex and diverse. It is changing quickly and it is often opaque. Indeed, the challenge of understanding China is so great that most people give up without even trying. Either they pretend that it isn't there or they fall back on a combination of factoids and underlying prejudices. But China can't be ignored and nor can it be dealt with through superficial attitudes. In an astonishingly short time, China has become the economic heart of this region. Australia joins a very long and lengthening list of countries that have China as their major trading partner. And such is its size that when China decides to do something, it has global implications. Bob Hawke, who is with us this evening, has described Deng Xiaoping's decision in 1978 to restructure the Chinese economy along market lines as the most momentous decision of the 20th century. To that decision, you can trace the beginning of the end of the Cold War, the dramatic decline in global poverty, the acceleration of globalisation, and the dawning of this century as the Indo-Pacific century. Last year, we asked Clinton Dines, the former president of BHP Billiton in China to present a business perspective on how China is changing. Clinton demonstrated powerfully how quickly China is changing and how dangerous it is to ignore or to simplify it. This year we wanted a different perspective. We wanted to zoom the analytical lens back out to look at a, chi at a changing China from a longer term and more international perspective. And who better to provide that perspective than our 2011 Changing China lecturer, Professor Wang Gangwu. Wang Gangwu is the, is the chairman of the East Asia Institute and a university professor at the National University of Singapore. He was born in Surabaya, Indonesia, and grew up in Ipoh, Malaysia. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees in history from the University of Malaya and a PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. He was professor at the University of Malaya and the ANU and vice-chancellor of the University of Hong Kong between 1986 and 1995. His scholarship has covered such diverse topics as classical and imperial Chinese history, overseas Chinese communities, Southeast Asia, Asian society's response to China and the Chinese Communist Party. His body of work is formidable, a rich vein of insight and understanding that combines deep knowledge, detailed research and pitch perfect feel. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the podium this year's Changing China lecturer, Professor Wang Gangwu. Thank you, Michael. It's really a great pleasure and honor to be speaking here. I've been hearing about the work of the Institute for some time, but uh, haven't had the opportunity to meet you and your colleagues. And uh, I'm delighted to see this Institute lodged in a most beautiful building. I hadn't uh, seen this, noticed this building before. So when I got up this morning and Ken Martin had a look at it, I thought, my goodness, this is the, this is the Lowy Institute. It's, uh, I gather it's a heritage building. It's something 
really quite rare and uh, in the great cities of the world fewer and fewer such buildings have been preserved so I'm particularly happy to see that that happened here. Uh, I've chosen to talk about China but it's such a big field. Uh, you forgive me if I just zeroed in on a few things which uh, struck me. And um, I begin by saying that China has been put in the same league table as the United States for quite a while now. So to talk of some kind of equality is not out of place. But this kind of equality does not necessarily translate into mutual respect. And I approach this topic of respect and equality in the context that uh, China is not the equal of the United States and that the two countries have different ideas about what they most respect. Also, I believe that attitudes towards the pursuit of equality between nations and judgments about what deserves respect are important in international affairs and how these two large and powerful countries manage concepts like equality and respect between them could seriously affect peace and stability in our region. One, one set of comparisons mark the heightened relationship between the two countries. And this was the suggestion that talking about a group of two, a G2, alongside the G8, would place the relationship between the US and China on a new footing. Now, given the obvious inequality between the two countries, it was surprising how long this term G2 was mentioned in the media, in media headlines in 2009 and even parts of 2010. This G2 idea was subjected to many interpretations. To some, it was just, uh, just a, a just recognition of China's new status in world affairs and should be seen as an offer on the part of the Americans for some kind of partnership with the other stakeholder. If that was true, it was visionary and constructive and showed a respect for China that China should welcome. Others were more skeptical and also for all sorts of reasons. And the reasons range from a deep distrust of the motives of the United States to all kinds of, on one hand, to all kinds of fears about China's own ambitions, and also to serious doubts about what such talk would do to America's established allies. Some even wondered how the United States could be so naive the Chinese leaders were openly puzzled. They too were puzzled. How there could be respect without equality on key matters of political and military power. Yet others in China suspected that the media attention was simply to scare readers into believing that a second not so benign superpower was on the horizon, rather like telling ghost stories to try to banish terror. This heavy coverage, for a while anyway, did not point to any real equality between the two nations. What became more obvious was the scant respect that the media in the two countries showed for each other. A week is a long time in politics, they say, and, and a month can be like eternity. That year-long play with words, with the possible G2 relationship, is now off the map. And headlines now focus on the new configurations in the old hotspots of the Middle East, the possible changes in the Arab world, and how do they affect the way we see the future of US-China relations. Obviously, international politics remains unpredictable, and words like equality and respect in that arena can quickly become meaningless. How will the events that no one had predicted for the Middle East push the US and China to recalibrate their relations yet again? 
It is likely that the relations between China and the United States will return to the front page, front pages before long, but it is unlikely to come back as a G2 syndrome or anything as simple as confrontation or partnership. But underlying issues of equality and respect, I believe, remain important. Let me review some of the references to G2, suggesting how that could shape the power structure in the Asia Pacific. From the start, there were different responses to the very idea of G2. For some, it appeared that the Americans who initiated the idea, those American commentators particularly, some very leading figures in the field, who initiated the idea and kept talking it up, were insincere. They seem to have used the term as a wishful device, either to get the Chinese to share the world's burden, burdens before they are ready, or to lure them to so much self-congratulation that they would accept more of the prevailing international norms that uh, people expect them to conform to. At the same time, many Chinese were flattered and taken together with the financial meltdown on Wall Street in the two years after 2008, the idea drew out expressions of great nationalist pride. But their leaders, the leaders in China, were pretty realistic, and they showed deep suspicions of the what they considered to be dubious honor conferred upon China. For those who believed that if China's economic growth is maintained, China could really be more equal before too long. The thinking about G2 was considered helpful. It was, after all, it would be better. It would be better if the United States and China could work together rather than to spin off in opposite directions towards hostility and bitter competition. Each country also, each country has people who also doubt that equality would bring about respect, that's certainly not necessarily so. For example, how many people in the United States seriously believe that China is its equal? It would be surprising if they were also to suggest that the Chinese state deserves their respect. Transnational capitalists may have found it profitable to engage China as an equal in commercial and industrial development, and show respect to Chinese technical skills and ingenuity. <clears throat> Strategic thinkers may need China to be seen as an equal in order to plan their worst case scenarios, but there is little respect for China's military capacity in the near future. Similarly, no one in China thinks that China is equal to the United States in power and wealth. Though many would consider that prospect, would consider that prospect attractive in the longer run. Even in traditional areas of culture and social values, most Chinese would acknowledge that the United States, as the leader of Western learning today, is superior in all scientific fields, including in the social sciences, at least for quite a while longer. Consequently, there is respect for American core achievements as the spearhead of Western civilization. In short, the combination of equality and respect that one that we might expect to find in the idea of a G2 partnership of two powerful countries is an ambiguously mixed one. It is far from clear that their energies could be channel channelized to make the world more peaceful and prosperous. Nevertheless, both countries cannot dismiss the perceptions and attitudes that are linked to persistent inequality and stubborn disrespect. The pursuit of national equality is often misunderstood. In both China and the United States, this is sometimes portrayed as a matter between two countries. This does not give enough weight to the history of China's pursuit of equality since the 19th century. 
That pursuit was focused on acquiring new knowledge to enable China to develop and become secure, become secure again. They began when China was successively defeated by two powerful maritime empires, the British and the French. Both powers demonstrated overwhelming superiority and were increasingly contemptuous towards the disintegrating Qing dynasty. In comparison, the United States seemed respectful and confined their demands in China to trade and trade alone. And perhaps expressions of missionary dedication that established numerous schools, colleges, and hospitals, and thus introduced modern ideas to ordinary Chinese, something that few other countries bothered to do. So for decades, the US displayed a willingness to offer a helping hand while the Europeans remained haughty and condescending. It was truly remarkable that within a decade of the disastrous Treaty of Peking of 1860, the Chinese court agreed to send 120 young Chinese boys to study in schools and colleges in New England. And the young boys were well received by the American educators. Although the experiment failed after only a few years, it was indicative of the respect that the Chinese had for the United States when China began to feel seriously threatened by the great imperial powers of the time. The point here is that no idea of national equality was involved. The Qing officials saw the Americans as softer, friendlier Westerners who could teach them what they wanted to learn without arrogance. Being themselves students and followers of European learning, the Americans could show the Chinese how to master new realms of knowledge. They were merely, in the eyes of the Chinese at the time, a few steps ahead in the same pursuit of equality with the powerful West, West of Western Europe. Similarly, even after being defeated by the Japanese in 1895, the Chinese sent their best students to Japan to study from people who had learned from the West so successfully. There was no questions concerning national equality or inequality with Japan either. They were simply fellow students of the advanced nations of the West who had acquired the new knowledge more quickly. All that was to change after the fall of the Qing dynasty and the establishment of the Republic. New expectations were aroused, especially after, after Japan achieved equality with European empires and began to behave with the same arrogance towards a China that was being destroyed by its own quarreling warlords and a whole series of civil wars. The national equality thereafter became a powerful issue and the desire to be united and strong became China's most urgent goal. At the same time, the United States as a nation also changed in Chinese eyes. At the end of the First World War, it had become another European power that was equal to Britain, France, Tsarist Russia, and Japan. It stood together with them in 1919, with all the others, at the Versailles Conference where the Chinese Republic as a new nation, and no longer the decrepit Manchu Empire, and the China as a new nation was openly humiliated. For the first time, all Chinese, whether literati, merchants, laborers, or peasant, were seen as feeble and unworthy of respect. At the Washington Conference three years later, this was confirmed when the United States, Japan, and Britain sorted out their naval power dis dispositions in the seas off the coast of China. It was obvious thereafter that China was no longer equal in the eyes of the imperial nations, and that now included both Japan and the United States. In that light, the pursuit of equality by all means became uppermost as the Chinese began to learn about nationalism in earnest. One product of this change was the rereading of modern history. 
It was only after the Versailles Conference that Chinese politicians began to date the loss of, equal loss of equality, as well as the loss of sovereignty, retrospectively back to the now renamed Unequal Treaties, signed after the Opium Wars of the 1840 and 1860 period. The recovery of equality thereafter became a national duty. Two generations of Chinese diplomats devoted themselves obsessively to this task until the end of the Second World War. The ability to de de eliminate inequality became the litmus test for all political leaders in China. For the next few decades, the Chinese still chose, chose to see the United States as the country that could still help China become equal to imperial powers like Britain and Japan. And even, even, even beyond that, and that United States could still help China balance the power of the Soviet Union of Stalin and Khrushchev after that. Now, America's experience as a colony that was liberated from another empire continued to, to place the image of America as being on the same side as, the, as that of China. It was seen as a successful student of the West who remained benign and could show the way towards China's recovery. The context changed when the bitter rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union, now both superpowers instead of mere imperial powers, made the question of national equality irrelevant, although nominally the new structure of the United Nations made it appear that all countries were equal. China was most fortunate that with United States support, it was among the five more than equal nations in that organization's Security Council. At least in theory, there was equality among the five nations, among five nations in the world. And China was more than content with that. For a poor and divided country in 1945, what more could it ask for? In Chinese eyes, the end of the Cold War in the 1990, in 1990s confirmed that the United States has come to inherit the mantle of the British Empire at its height. This new power covers the whole world, as the British Empire did. Its reach and impact is even more comprehensive and much greater. At the same time, if the analogy is taken further, the new imperial structure could also decline, as the earlier empire had done after a century or so. In order to avoid doing that, in order to avoid declining, the Chinese ask, will the United States look out for a rival or potential enemy or seek to engage a powerful partner? Whichever choice the United States made, China would have to be conferred some degree of equality. This is the context of the G2 syndrome as the Chinese saw it. If it meant that China also had a choice whether to become an enemy or a partner, uh, then the question is, is that the kind of equality that China has been seeking during the past century? The Chinese love to say he er bu tong, meaning to be in harmony but remain distinct and different. Now, can that define an equality that is accompanied by respect for each other's differences. Equality can also be an evocative idea that has little to do with nations. For the individuals to be equal before God has always been a great comfort. But it is not a proposition that can be easily demonstrated. More tangible is for people to be equal before the law but the idea of being equal as nations in international courts is new and still being tested. However, the ideal of all humans being born with equal rights is perhaps the highest expression of 
this level of equality. And it is an idea that has captured the imagination of everyone, including the Chinese. But China's ruling elites have a different heritage, one that assumes that hierarchy is a worldly norm. And this has not present, prevented Chinese dissenters over the past 2,000 years from promoting various kinds of egalitarianism for which millions of rebels have fought for and sought to implement. And the most recent example was that led by supporters of Mao Zedong himself in the name of equality during the Cultural Revolution. But the consequences were so dire that the Chinese people have forsworn such extreme calls for egalitarianism altogether. Today, the people live and seem to be willing to put up with a kind of inequality of wealth and status in China that, is rare, that has rarely been seen even in, in its own imperial past. Here, the Chinese have a mixed picture of the United States. Their textbooks still refer to the time when the rougher Americans in the gold fields and elsewhere showed their contempt for Chinese immigrants in the West Coast states and humiliated them. That was a time when China was given lessons in diplomatic equality, while Chinese as people were clearly treated as inferior. Also, the Qing government seemed not to have cared, uh, not to have cared much, because Manchu aristocrats and the Chinese mandarins uh, who traveled around were shown official respect, even while anti-Chinese exclusion acts were being passed by the US Congress. Now, what is significant during the past 30 years is that the Chinese have learned how much the United States has changed. They observe that the relative inequality in the United States is set at a level where equality of opportunity is institutionalized, and very few are desperately poor. Now, this is something they can admire. In fact, such a realizable ideal of equal opportunity is something that they claim to be committed to establishing in their own society. Linked to the idea of equality are other com comparisons. Many people had forgotten that China, China had been politically and economically superior in much of Asia for centuries up until the 18th century. There is now a growing literature about China re-emerging with images of the country being restored to its earlier greatness. Historians in the West seem to agree that up to the 18th century, Qing Empire, the Qing Empire was one of the richest economies in the world. And some predict that the current China will regain that position in the next decade or two. On this issue, there are those in China who think that the pursuit of economic equality with the US is too modest. The country should expect ultimately to recover the political and cultural primacy beyond Asia. In that context, China's economic performance these past 30 years was but a prelude to what will happen later in the 20th, 21st century. But primacy, of, obviously, is not equality. And equality has never impressed the Chinese elites. Their political culture, expressed through 2,000 years of exhortation, has always emphasized the enduring security that came out of prosperity and stability within and respect and admiration without. The current leadership seemed to have reaffirmed this goal in its rhetoric. But as long as it fails to gain a broader political and cultural respect by other nations for China, it may have to be satisfied to play the kind of ranking game in the league tables that quantitative methods and attitudes favor. The task of winning respect is a great deal more demanding. 
Foreign views about China have varied considerably over the past 3,000 years. In the past, overland, the tribal confederations in the north that conquered China regularly had coveted its riches and showed very little respect whenever the Chinese state was militarily weak. Beyond the seas, notably in South and Southeast Asia, trading with China was profitable. But apart from some ceremonial genuflections, little attention was paid to what China stood for. Except for Japan and Korea in Northeast Asia, nothing much was written by China's neighbors about Chinese ideas and achievements. Most of these states did not even bother to flatter the Chinese by learning from its culture or by copying its social and political institutions. This never seemed to have troubled the Chinese state, and its rulers were content to have occasional contacts and demonstrations of ritual respect. It was only after the Western maritime powers power reached China, reached Chinese shores, and industrial capitalism led to new levels of global wealth and power that the security landscape was radically changed, even for China. And even then, China could assume that there was respect, at least for a while, for its dynastic empire, at least for its ancient civilization, if not for its governance principles. Thus, at no point in China's long history did its ruling elites doubt that respect for their success in enabling such a large territory to be united and stay united and stable, more or less, was the measure of its worthiness. The record shows that respect for China was the norm. China rarely lost it, lost what it saw as respect for Chinese civilization. And when it did lose that respect, it was never for very long. To expect that the time has come for China to be respected again can be said to be something much to be desired by, the, by all Chinese. The issue today hinges on how much the criteria for winning that respect have changed. For example, there is one kind of respect that is measured purely by material success. But there are other kinds that are determined by intellectual achievements and standards of humanitarian behavior. And there is also the kind of respect that demands that China conforms to what is described as international norms. In this context, the relations between the United States and China will depend more on the respect that can be developed between them as modern societies and cultures than on mere notions of abstract and legal equality. That is a kind of equality between nations as defined in law. For China, at least, sustained displays of respect, however symbolic and ceremonial, are more meaningful than regular measurements to determine equality. The story of the relationship here is mixed. During the past 150 years, the Chinese state recalls the times when the US had come to China's aid against imperial powers like Britain, France, Japan, and Russia, and offered to treat China fairly. Whenever that happened, China had taken, had taken it to reflect a respect that they greatly appreciated. At a different level, the Chinese also remember that large numbers of Chinese merchants and laborers were ill-treated in the United States, and that was regrettable. But the fact that there was a lack of national consciousness under Manchu rule partly explains why the reaction by the Qing government, Qing government was muted at the time, and how the anger against the United States was kept under control. Most Chinese now celebrate the new U.S. immigration policies since the 1960s that have enabled hundreds of thousands of Chinese 
to settle and ultimately integrate into American society. These may have raised expectations of many beyond what could be justified, but the main trends have marked a welcome change and have done much to ease Sino-American relations at all levels. But there remain uncertainties that stem from different ideals and ideologies. At the heart of, of it is what the U.S. stands for as the sole superpower, one that knowingly or otherwise has inherited the ambitions of the British Empire to protect its interests by setting international standards and claiming to side with the weak against the strong. There is no question of China challenging that or even wanting to do so, certainly not on a global scale. China has no stomach or ambition to be equal to the United States in that regard. In fact, Chinese strategic thinkers today suggest that China is not so foolish even to try. But some Chinese also look to the U.S. as a superpower that is prepared to surpass British achievements in the realms of ideals and institutions, ideals and institutions. When that is bolstered by a strong missionary tradition, however, Chinese responses are divided. Ordinary Chinese welcome the promise of higher standards of justice and administrative transparency as they lose respect for the state practices that are current today in China. Increasingly, more of these practices are seen as being concerned to protect the interests of the ruling party and its leaders. Young, younger, educated Chinese wonder how they can adapt the progressive ideas from the West to help them revive the distinctive values that made them Chinese. As the governing party responds to changing expectations among its people, some of its leaders have come to fear that learning some Western ideals could actually threaten its monopoly of power. Yet at the national level, they also recognize that it is in the country's interest to accept the key features of modernization, of international behavior, even though many still see them as having been set by the United States and its allies. Let me end with a few examples from some recent events. In February, a few weeks ago, the United Nations Security Council voted unanimously to impose sanctions on the government of Colonel Gaddafi of Libya. For the first time, it agreed to refer a case of state violence to the International Criminal Court. China voted together with the United States on this matter. Both countries displaying a, de a degree of respect they have not often showed to each other, shown to each other on the Security Council. At the same time, the U.S. media picked up the analogy of Tahrir Square in Cairo and other similar centers of demonstrations in the Arab world with Tiananmen Square in Beijing and dwelt on the fact that the Chinese media were constrained to report fully on the Middle East disorders. Chinese dissenters, mainly overseas but also in Hong Kong, and with the support of the United States media, were also actively blogging with calls for brave Chinese citizens to meet in several major cities to display their discontent with the PRC government. Even the United States ambassador in Beijing was involved with the police uh, action at Wang Fujing in Beijing against possible or potential protesters. Now clearly the media saw the United States on the right side of history and memories of China's record on Tiananmen uh, have encouraged some to think that this is an opportunity to shame the Chinese leaders to make the political reforms that are long overdue. There was no question here of American respect for Chinese sensitivities, nor Chinese niceties about foreign journalists, least of all American ones. The widespread use of in the Chinese blogs and by the media outside China 
of the word Bientian, uh, which means changes of changes in heaven, changes of weather, to describe what was happening in the Middle East, was striking. This word Bientian uh, is a reference to regime change in certain contexts. And the word has been used to remind Chinese readers that weather or regime change could come about peacefully, without violence, and without many deaths. One reference, one other reference to Tiananmen that was picked up in several blogs was a particularly painful reminder to the Chinese authorities. It came from Colonel Gaddafi himself when he equated his actions with those of the Chinese government in the use of military force to quell the protest in Beijing, in Beijing, in the Beijing Square uh, 21 years ago. He promised he would be equally successful. And this showed a kind of respect that the Chinese leaders could hardly have welcomed. Now, this is not the place to go into the rights and wrongs of using such analogies. It is interesting enough for China to act together with the US in the Security Council, and at the same time and in the same week to have its use of violent suppression in 1989 quoted approvingly by Colonel Gaddafi as comparable to his own. The Chinese also observed with keen interest that despite decades of attention and support and billions of aid and arms sales to several states in the Middle East, the United States was surprised by the fall from grace of their friends in Tunisia and Egypt and possibly others elsewhere in the Arab world. The Americans seem still to be struggling to show respect to the Arab peoples that their political friends in the Arab states have kept down for so long. The burdens of a superpower are truly onerous and unpredictable, and China will not be slow to take note of that. How this affects China's future thinking about its own non-didactic and non-interventionist policies in Africa and elsewhere will be worthy of close scrutiny. One other comparison is worth making. The size of US oil investments in Libya is small, but recently had recently been growing. The number of Chinese companies operating there, however, has grown very fast indeed. The former, the American investment, involves a few large companies and is capital intensive. While the latter, the Chinese investment, involves scores of labor intensive enterprises. The difference in financial terms uh, is hard to ascertain and I haven't been able to do that. But many more Chinese citizens, some 35,000 of them, were caught in the fighting as compared with just a few hundred Americans. Evacuating the Chinese workers was indeed a serious problem. The Chinese do not have bases in Europe or naval and air forces close by in the Mediterranean or in the Red Sea. Thus, they had a very difficult time sending ships and planes to pick up these 35,000 workers who were forced to leave the violence. That they did so successfully is indeed remarkable. It is something that they have not had to do since they evacuated ethnic Chinese out of Indonesia after the fall of Sukarno uh, in 1965. And, and that was done over a long period, over several months. In this case, the operation was successful within days. So much so that all reports spoke of China with considerable respect. And the Chinese are justifiably proud of that achievement and could see that as a claim for international equality and respect. For the past 30 years, China has come a long way towards adjusting to international norms, and where it has not gained allies, has been exceedingly cautious not to offend friendly countries. It has been meticulous in examining every action in terms of its own national interests, however narrow that might have been. At times, for example, on questions of legal equality 
associated with issues of sovereignty, the government has been stubbornly correct and legalistic. At other times, it has shown great flexibility. But in terms of political and judicial reforms, especially where individual rights and liberties are concerned, the ruling party has not been willing to accept any criticism. It has determined that national interests are being well protected by the party, that the party embodies the nation, and therefore only the party can ensure China's security and continued rise to prosperity. Any criticism threatens what has been achieved so far. As a result, China's record in the treatment of dissenters and whistleblowers has been contrary to the ideals of justice and fairness that even most Chinese now expect. Some of the authorities' actions stem from poor governance, but many others are rooted in selfish interests that protect those in power from public scrutiny. The emerging social contradictions are obvious. If they're not corrected, China cannot expect much respect from the Chinese people themselves. If these malpractices are not ameliorated, the US will also find it difficult to show respect. And without respect, the semblance of equality will ultimately count for little. There was for so much of modern Chinese history, moments when a little equality in the eyes of others would have meant so much for the Chinese people, not least when it came from the United States and its people. Today, as China gains greater equality globally, the thinking people in China have begun to ask what equality is worth if there is no respect. They have come to understand how much harder it is to earn a broader respect. They now know that seeking it from the outside, including from the US and its people, can only be superficial unless there is also a community of respect within the nation. Only when the Chinese people have created the conditions for a more just and caring society can they find self-respect. And it is in that realm of self-respect that can, could possibly ensure enduring respect from the world outside. Thank you.